Acts chapter 26 in your Bible. We'll take a few moments and review where we are in uh, this story. Of course, this is a trial and a, and a happening in Paul's life that has been uh, taking place since the end of Acts 21. All uh, a misrepresentation of him and, and on trial and rescued really by the Romans from the Jews and then sent off to Caesarea and then in front of Felix who didn't charge him but also didn't free him. And then Festus comes. And uh, in, in, in chapter 25, Festus is now in charge of this area. And he presents his case in front of Festus. And he's not given justice there either. Now, this is just my uh, surmising. This is just my uh, estimation at what he did and why he did what he did. But in chapter 25, at the end of that, he says, I appeal to Caesar. I believe he saw that it wasn't right what had happened with Felix. It certainly wasn't right already what was happening with Festus. Uh, I believe he knew he wasn't going to get a fair shake of the matter, which is why he said, I appeal to Caesar. But now that he's appealed to Caesar, it doesn't matter what happens in any of these trials. As a Roman citizen, he goes to Rome. Now, he may not stand before Caesar himself, but he gets to stand before that court. And, and we ended last week with... The idea that Festus, it was in a pickle, so to speak, right? It's kind of stuck. Well, we saw he was stuck in the end of the chapter. I'm sending him to, to, to Caesar, but I don't know what to write. Because why? Because he's innocent. Well, why couldn't Festus just have said, okay, you're innocent. I'm going to set you free. Anybody want to answer that? Why couldn't he have just set him free if he knew he was innocent? No, Festus is in charge. Festus is the boss here. He wanted to please the Jews. He wanted to please the Jews. He's in charge of this Jewish area. And if all the chief priests and leaders are not happy with his decision, word may get back to the main boss and he might get the boot. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing that uh, people wanting to please other people, the higher powers in charge and wanting to keep them happy goes way back. All right, that's not just the day and age in which we live. And so Festus, willing to please the Jews, not able to release Paul, and, and he gets an out almost because King Agrippa comes in town, Herod Agrippa, his sister Bernice. And Herod Agrippa is a Jew, part Jew. He knows a lot more about this than the Roman Festus. And so we saw last week that he said, Agrippa, I need you to hear this case. I've got a guy here. You, you'll never believe what happened. And, and the conversation between Festus and Agrippa was one about who? Jesus. About Paul, of this man Jesus. We saw last week that Paul kept the main thing, the main thing. He talked often about Jesus. And at the end of the chapter, a uh, a hearing, not really a hearing, that's the wrong word for it because there's nothing official in regards to this. But now they're in an auditorium, a coliseum-like place. And now all the leaders of the city, all the higher-ups are there with Festus and they're there with Agrippa and they're there with Bernice and all the pomp and circumstance. Remember we saw that last week as, as the, the royalties are there and they're seated. As Festus gives opening remarks in the end of the chapter, saying that this is where we are, I need your help. And then we made it uh, to chapter number 26, which is where we'll begin this evening. Now, I'll say here from the beginning, all of chapter 26, for the most part, is Paul's testimony, what he says. But if you think we're going to get all the way through chapter 26 this evening, uh, then I've got a beachfront property in Oklahoma I want to sell you. So... Uh, we won't get through it all. If we did, we may be here till eight or nine, which some of you I know wouldn't have a problem with that. I'm a little tired. I don't think I'll make it till eight or nine tonight. So we'll get through maybe about 18 or 20 verses. And, and there's a good stopping point there as well. But we're going to see this, a life-changing testimony. Now, don't get ahead of me. Some of you are already reading. All right, look right. A life-changing testimony is what we're going to look at this evening. And uh, you'll enjoy it as we go through it. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can open your word, open our hearts, we pray, open our eyes, our ears, our understanding to what you have for us, not just to learn a history lesson tonight, 
but to see how it applies to us today. Thank you that your word is alive and well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Verse number 26, the Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. What we see here at the very beginning really is Paul's respect to Agrippa. Was Agrippa one that deserved respect? Oh no, he was quite the uh, uh, fleshly leader, quite the immoral leader and family. Let's consider his family history again. His great-grandfather was the one that tried to kill Jesus as a baby and murdered all of the babies, uh, the Hebrew children born two years and younger. That's his great-grandfather. His grandfather is the one that chopped off the head of John the Baptist. That's his great-grandfather. His dad or his uncle, some, uh, common, it's, some scholars differ on this, but somebody, his dad or his uncle, is the one who killed James back in Acts 12, the first apostle that was martyred. So he doesn't deserve any respect. And yet Paul shows him respect from the very beginning. As, as leaders, the best kind of respect is, is earned, not, not demanded. And yet we see all throughout Scripture, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. We see in Scripture there is no power but of God. You know the next phrase in that verse? The powers that be are ordained of God. I don't believe in this leader and this, this is that, this is that. Not my president. That. Be careful. Is God in control or no? And we ought to have respect. Now, anytime any leader in any authority position tells us to go against God and his word, we know who we should obey and should believe. But uh, we're seeing here, Paul even respects Agrippa. It says he stretched forth his hand. If you if you have seen statues from those days or oftentimes pictures of those days, you'll see a hand outstretched. That was a form of respect there in those days. But again, I mentioned this this morning. We have a group of leaders, higher ups, important people, free men, all going to hear from a captive. And yet the way God has it set up is the one free man has a captive audience that can now hear about Christ. Isn't it amazing how God ordains this? Isn't it amazing back in Acts 9, around verse 15 or so, I believe, where God told Paul he's going to stand before kings? And here he is. Probably not the way Paul drew it up, but the way God did nonetheless. He shows respect unto uh, Agrippa and, and this audience. The first few verses, notice what he does. Verse 2, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I'm accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, whereof I beseech thee to hear me patiently. You can hear it really just in the text there, his voice. Agrippa, I'm, I'm glad you're giving me this opportunity. I, I know that you're well aware of the customs and traditions of the Jews. And so I'm glad I can speak to you about this because we've got some common, common ground. He begins with common knowledge and then he goes to his background. Verse number four, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So again, if you notice, it, this is a brilliant speech that he gives and testimony that he gives. But look right up here. He, he starts finding some common knowledge with Agrippa. Mm -hmm. Then he gives some facts about his life that can't be argued. In fact, he probably pointed to some of them, I imagine. These guys know me. No, I grew up in Jerusalem. Now, we know he was born Saul of, starts with a T, Saul of Tarsus. But at a young age, apparently, he moved to Jerusalem and, and was trained amongst those in Jerusalem. 
And, and, and furthermore, he says, I was in the straightest sect of our religion. I lived a Pharisee. His goodness, he was top notch in regards to Jews. It's what he's, it's what he's telling Agrippa. By the way, I, I, I skipped over saying this and goodness gracious of all things as a preacher. Verse number three, he says at the end, whereof I beseech thee to hear me patiently. You understand what he's saying there? I'm not going to be short. I will take my time. Listen up. All right. Anyway, I uh, just thought that's funny. Verse number six. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God under our fathers. Unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. He said, Agrippa, I'm here. You know my testimony. I, I grew up as a Jew. And, and you know the Old Testament. You know the prophets speak often of the coming of the Messiah. You know that's our hope. You know that's what we're all praying for, which, by the way, Jews today are still praying for. He, he says, you know all that promise. That, that promise is... Is what is why I'm here today. Don't you find that interesting? As a Jew, that I'm here for which hope's sake I'm accused of the Jews. So there's nothing yet in his testimony that anybody can argue with. Not only that, there there are so many facts in there, but there's also an appeal to the the hope that Jews have. So he, he reviews his life, his training as a child. He reviews the, the hope and the tradition that he has. And then we get to verse number eight. He asks a question. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Before he even gets to Jesus, he just says, Agrippa, don't you think God can do something? Don't you think God can raise the dead? Again, Everybody has to agree with him so far. Verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So the first time he mentions Jesus is now in this section where he says, back as a Pharisee, I heard of Jesus and I thought in my zeal as a Jew, we can't let this happen. Followers of his, uh-uh. We got to get them out. Verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I can almost hear Paul almost in a matter and a tone of repentance, saying, Agrippa, I, that was me. Some of these priests here gave me liberty to go in, to, to, to do these things, to put some in prison, to see some of them killed, to put my voice against them. It, it seems as though there's an implication here that he had a vote, which means he was part of the Sanhedrin, which was the highest council. Verse 11, I, and I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. He said, you know, if it wasn't enough to kill some or to shut them up in prison, I... I made some of them blaspheme, meaning recount Jesus. I, I persecuted them. I was so mad against them, even under strange cities, meaning to foreign lands. I, I went outside this, the boundary of Israel because I was so zealous for God. As a Jew, I was so, so sure that I had this right and that I was doing things for God the right way that I made sure these followers of Jesus no, 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 we're not, we're not dealing with that. You know, think about in a, in a court of law, oftentimes uh, it's one word against the other. 
right? And arguments, it's my word against your word. Paul figured out and knew from the very beginning it, it didn't matter, my word against their word. They have no proof. And so what he does is he cites his behavior, his beliefs, his manner of life. He spoke to his priorities in life. And by the way, that's something that strengthens your testimony. Not so much your words. But we can see here, uh, I, I can't remember which author it was that said this, but he said this, your actions speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. We can say, watch this, even as we were in it this morning, we can say that God's in charge of my life, but do we live that way? Paul said, forget what I'm saying. Look at what I did. Agrippa, I, I'm in this. I'm zealous more for God than anybody here. They think they're high up in the Jewish religion. They ain't got nothing on me. And so he tells of all of this truth. And by the way, when you speak the truth, you don't have to add fluff. We'd never see a lot of fluff in Paul's speeches, in, in, in Paul's testimonies. And fluff um, may, may look good and may appear good on the surface, but there's no substance to it. I, I firmly believe preaching ought not to be filled with fluff. Yep. God's word has plenty for us to preach. Yeah. And, and we ought to tell it, we ought to live a life that's not full of fluff, but full of truth. All of that is beside the point tonight. But there's a lot of st extra stuff in here uh, from Paul's testimony. But now we're getting to the good part. He's dealt with the, the previous life and the bad part. Verse number 12, he says this, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Oh, I love it how he says that. I had authority to do this. I was on a mission. I had a purpose. He went to Damascus. By the way, Damascus is not in Israel. Okay, it's in Syria. He's going way far out to stamp out the followers of Jesus. Verse 13, everything changes. At midday, keep that in mind, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. Can you imagine noon? The brightest time of the day? A light shining above that which is the sun? He says, this was unmistakable. This wasn't something I thought I might have seen and maybe the stars aligned in such a way that I saw this or I had this. Little, no, he said, this was big. A light that shone. In, in, in his testimony in Acts 9, it says the men which journey with them stood speechless. God knew it would take a major confrontation to shake Paul from his hatred of Jesus and his followers. God knew it would take more than a little gentle nudge to get Paul's attention. I don't know your testimony. Some of you maybe needed the nudge. Some of you needed the light from heaven at midday. But we all needed God to do something in our lives to get our attention to him. And that's what he does with Paul. Notice what happens. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In that one statement that Jesus made to Paul, we see so, so much. We'll go through this rather quickly, but I see, first of all, it's a personal touch. He calls him by name. You know what? I'm so glad that he knows my name. He calleth thee by name. You are not one of the crowd. You are... You, in God's eyes, he sees you for who you are, right where you are. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou 
me. What else do we see in this? Was Paul persecuting Jesus? He said, why persecutest thou me? Who was Paul persecuting? The church, other Christians, the body of Christ. Jesus says, I take this personally. You, I see personally, but what you're doing, I take personally. Then he says this, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. A, a prick, oftentimes, that this was a, an instrument that farmers would use as they would plow with an ox. Think about it for a moment. You're on a plow, ox is in front of you pulling the plow. Sometimes an ox would think, I don't want to do this anymore. I, this is a heavy load. I'm stopping. What do you think the farmers would do with a long stick and a point on the end of it? Yeah, they would goad them. Get going. What do you think the ox would do at times? They would kick against those bricks. And so they would kick against it, but you know what they eventually had to do? Keep going. They may keep getting prodded, but they're going to get going eventually no matter how much they kick against it. You know what Jesus is telling Saul? Hey, buddy. I've tried to make myself known to you. You've kicked against it for a while. You're not getting away from me this time. <laughs> I think back. When would have God done something to get Saul's attention? Paul's attention. I just kind of gave you a, a reminder of that. Saul, remember when he witnessed Stephen's death, first martyr? He, he's watching it. Can you imagine the Lord working on his heart then? Look how serious these are for me. I don't know other times, but apparently Saul had been kicking against the bricks and Jesus said no more. It's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And verse 15, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Consider this for a moment. Oh, this had to have been the, the big turning point for Saul. He says, I am Jesus. Now, hold on. All Paul had known was that Jesus had died. Mm -hmm. He's not alive. That's what these followers made up. Some people think they saw him, and now they're following him, and they're followers of Jesus, but he's dead. And now we have that Jesus speaking to him. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And when he says, I am Jesus, he's saying, I, I'm alive. By the way, I'm alive in glory, not dead in shame. Mm -hmm. And when you persecute Christians, you're persecuting me. Watch this. Don't miss this. When you persecute Christians, you're persecuting me. And when you're persecuting me, you're persecuting God, the very God you claim zealously to follow. That had to have completely changed Paul's mind and mindset. Because who was Paul? Someone who was zealously following God according to his religion. There are so many people today, watch this, please, don't, don't miss this. This is the crux, really, of our message, and we'll go through a few more verses. There are so many people that day, today that want to follow God. And they may do it in the name of their religion. And it's okay to say you believe in God, but as soon as we say Jesus, yeah. Yeah. oh, there's a big difference now. Yeah. And yet Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yeah. It's our job to preach Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on. Christ is love. It's our job to show his love to others. It's our job to, to live a life that, as we saw, that's filled this morning, filled with all the fullness of God so that uh, we can preach Jesus, so that he can make himself known in our lives to other people. May we be zealously following God, just as Paul was. But then Paul got an immediate 180 turn. Wait a minute. He's alive? I'm persecuting him? Not good. The conviction he felt was very real. Yeah. Notice what happens. Verse 16. This is still Jesus talking to Paul. He says, but rise. 
stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. There's so much in this verse. He says, Paul, get up. Paul had fallen to the ground, which is okay. Humility, submission. But he said, don't stay there. I got a job for you. I want you to get up and get going. May I encourage you, Christian, now is not the time to be down on the ground. Now's not the time to be slacking off and watching others do the work. Now's the time that Jesus says, rise, stand upon thy feet. I've appeared unto thee for this purpose. But wait a minute. Back in verse number uh, uh, 12, he says, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Paul was going somewhere with a purpose. But now he's got a whole new purpose. And he had to determine, am I going to follow man's purpose or am I going to follow God's purpose for my life? Child of God, this evening, you and I have a purpose. And by the way, man will tell you what your purpose is. And God will tell you what his purpose is. you got to determine, am I going to follow man or am I going to follow God? This is a life-changing testimony for Paul. He was determined to live a life for a purpose, live life for God, and then he saw Jesus. And that's the way to God. And I've, I've got it all wrong. I've got to stop following man's purpose. And with the same zeal and intensity that he lived his former life, now he's going to live his life for God. And each one of you can have the same life-changing testimony. Here's the difference. You look here. The difference is... Sometimes we want to be off and on with our own purpose. The difference is, do we believe Jesus saying, I've got something for you? Because he does for every one of you. We may say, well, I I'm not this or I don't have this ability like this person. And we compare and this and that. And then he says, no, 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 Saul, Saul. I don't know how quickly he said those words. I, I imagine it was a quite a bit of distance between them. Saul. Wait a minute. Did I just hear what I think I heard? Saul. Yes, you heard. And yes, I'm speaking specifically to you. And isn't the Holy Spirit good at that? It's like, I didn't wear my steel toe boots. He's stepping all over my toes today. He puts his thumb right on that in your heart and life. Some of you look, what did you tell pastor this week? You know, how does he know that? I didn't know. Holy Spirit knows and he does his work. Life-changing testimony. I've appeared unto thee, he says, for this purpose. Now he's got a new purpose. He says to make the, uh, notice, a minister and a witness. What's a minister? Minister is a servant, isn't it? A servant. You and, all, you and I all are, should be ministers for Christ. Serving Christ. If we're, if we're content sitting back and taking it all in, then we've missed God's purpose. God's purpose in his church is always to serve him. He said, I've made you a minister and a witness. Don't think that serving is enough. Serve and tell. Tell others, a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, what I'm doing right now, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Even to Saul, he said, I'm not even going to tell you all of it right now. <laughs> you can't handle it, buddy. Just know this. There's a lot more coming. i got a lot more for you. A minister and a witness. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. <laughs> a Jew the most staunch Jew is now going to go to the Gentiles? Talk about a life-changing testimony. Zealously following God in the name of religion, now zealously following God in the name of Jesus. Zealously uh, leading for Jews and now zealously preaching to Gentiles. Verse number 18, here's what's going to happen. To open their eyes. What happens when you open their eyes? To turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. See the four things that he called them to do. When you preach, they open their eyes. It's going to turn them from darkness to light. There's the first one. It's not your job to turn them from darkness to light. It's your job to minister and be a witness. And when you do what I purposed you to do, they'll go from darkness to light. And they'll go from the power of Satan unto God. Do we see folks under the power of Satan today? God says, I got a purpose. Be a minister and a witness. And folks can go from the power of Satan unto God. Folks can go from darkness to light that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins in the Jewish religion, there's a whole process through that. And, and I love the words that are used in the last part of verse 18, and inheritance, I mean, I've got something for them, among them which are sanctified by offering religious sacrifices. It's not what the verse says. Inheritance among them which are sanctified by being a good little Jew. No. <laughs> Inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus. And so, go back to the, the story of this chapter. Paul is speaking in front of Agrippa, in front of all the leaders. And he's saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a Jew from the beginning and always zealously following the Lord, but God got my attention. The God that we all claim to follow, he got my attention and then Jesus spoke to me. And he said, I I'm alive and, and you're persecuting me. What are you doing? I've been working in your life to get your attention to me. I've got something for you. I've got a purpose for you. I want you to minister and to witness to, to the Gentiles and watch the life-changing power that I'm going to do when they're sanctified by faith that's in me. What a powerful testimony he gives. We'll end with verses 19 and 20. He says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. <laughs> King, um, I had to obey that. Wouldn't you? I mean, if God showed up to you in the middle of the day with a bright light, if he got your attention, if he called you personally by name, yeah. if he said, you know, now's the time. You choose to follow me or we're done. And he gave me a task and a purpose to do. I'm all in for him. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Verse 20, but showed first unto them of Damascus. That's where he went first with this information. That's where he received his sight back. And at Jerusalem, that's where he went next to the disciples. And throughout all the coasts of Judea, all around that area. And then to the Gentiles. That they should repent and turn to God. And do works meet for repentance. I love how he uses these words, repent and turn to God. That's what repentance is. Turning away from me and to God. It's two sides of the same coin. That's what repentance is. It's not, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing and now I'm going to add Jesus into the mix and kind of mix it all up and make sure I got it right. No. Repent and turn to God. My way doesn't work. His way does. He is the way. I'm going to turn to him. And furthermore, when we turn to him, we'll do works meet for repentance, meaning my faith is going to show itself by good works. James 2, as a result of. Paul says, my life changed, Agrippa. We can all agree that I was a good Jew. And, and I did my best to zealously follow God, but then Jesus got my attention and has changed my life. And I want to follow him. I still want to zealously, uh, th this hope that we have, he came, the Messiah came. I, I want to follow him. I, I, I'm here because I'm following him. You can read later on this evening. Uh, the, the rest of the chapter and, and see kind of what happens. But it had its impact. 
on this wicked king. He got their attention. How did he get their attention? Here's how. Simply by sharing a life-changing testimony. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because hopefully it's all of us, but if I were, don't do it. <laughs> how many of you, your life's been changed by Jesus? The truth of the matter is it's all of us. Yeah. And if he hasn't changed your life, he wants to. But now that he has, it's not just for you to live happily ever after. Right. It's for you and I to tell others how he can change their life. He's brought certain people into your life that you can affect for him. That you ought to be a minister and a service, a witness to. I ought to. We can't just sit idly by with what Jesus has done. We must share our life-changing testimony. And you'll be amazed when you and I come to the end of our lives, whenever that may be, we can look back and see he wanted me to share that and he had a lot for me going forward too. Can you imagine Jesus telling Saul, by the way, this is what you're going to do over the next few decades. You're going to travel the countryside. You're going to preach everywhere. They're going to leave you for dead. You're going to go back and preach and you're going to start churches here and this and that. What? He didn't have to agree to all that right then. He just had to say, yes, Lord, today you've changed my life. I'm going to go forward on purpose for you. Christian tonight, a life-changing testimony. You and I have it. Let's share it with others. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this evening. Thank you for listening.